guns and cut his hands off. Yeah, here's, here's my, my fork, sorry. Okay. Um, hey, I'm Kevin. Hi, I'm Phil. Oh, I'm Larry. And uh, we're doing stuff and things. I'm stuff, he's mm, and he's things. I'm things. I'm, yeah. And I think this might be episode 10. We're almost done with our first full season. <clears throat> season. Whatever that means, who really yeah, knows. Cue the Halo 3 confetti. Yeah. And things are getting better. So maybe our next season, things will look a lot better. Who knows? Who's that? Anyways, today we're going to talk about... Uh, I am under the belief that America, or maybe not even America, but America definitely um, is on the verge of another war, an impending war, um, just from historically looking back at how things have progressed through history. Um, it seems like it's inevitable at this point, uh, timeline wise. So we're going to hit on some things there and you can agree with me, disagree with me. That's okay. We want comments. So, yeah. well, let me, uh, let me ask a couple questions so that we know what we're talking about. Uh, are you talking a war of global implication with direct access like World War One or World War Two? Uh-huh. Or are you talking about a localized conflict like Vietnam was that drug elements of the world into it? Um, because there's little wars like that that are probably pending everywhere right now. Or is it a, a, a war that doesn't look like a war like the Cold War was uh, with the Soviet Union? Or is it a terrorist patterned war like I, we were fighting a few years ago? I feel like it'd be more... Um, world war feeling but i think it would definitely start as a civil-esque type of war um before we started recording though phil had mentioned with just the accessibility that we have now in our world that it would very quickly could become a world war phenomenon yeah. so well it's like i should mention that before like as we get into this situation the multitude of factors you like to be completely correct about this, you have to have a deep knowledge of financial markets and and stock histories. You have to be very informed on social history, right. and you have to be very informed on economics, and you also have to be very informed on military history. So, like, there's there's a ton of factors involved. So, with it being between like a localized conflict that starts to influence global opinion, like Vietnam or terrorist struggles or a world war or just a or a single, single uh, concentrated war between two parties, like those don't happen anymore. It's all proxy wars now, generally. Right. And and you also have the reason that America would be threatened by a conflict is because you have nations. From my understanding, you have nations like Russia and China who, for decades, have been trying to position themselves to be in a position of leverage or power to gain more power on the world stage because what's generally referred to as the post-war order is the U.S. has been the dominant global force since 1918, really, but especially since 1945. So that's been the balance of power for a long, long time. And from what little I've learned about China's, you know, long-term global aspirations is they're extremely long-term about it. And they're extremely, extremely diligent in doing their due pro their due diligence in corners of life and economics that most people aren't giving attention to. Right. And so they're being very, very long-term about it. And they're, they're in Russia and China know that they can't just go straight affront to the U S because our military strength is, is that superior. Um, but if at any time the America does become destabilized, it, it will threaten a lot of different processes worldwide. And so that's why I think it would tend more toward the global. Right. So, yeah, I think, that it would stand, a, a civil war would be more impending is there's just a lot of red flags that are mm -hmm. are showing up to me, which would be our economy, number one. Uh, we're in the greatest amount of debt we've ever been in mm -hmm. as a country, um, and it seems an insurmountable amount to get out of. That would be the first thing. The second thing is um, the division amongst Americans itself seems to be getting larger and larger. And I realize that throughout society, there's always been this clash of ideas. And so that's nothing new, but it, it seems to be getting torn more and more apart. And 
for instance, with the president we have right now, the Democratic Party is trying to do anything in their power to get rid of him instead of working with him, not necessarily agreeing with his ideas, but still trying to at least get the country going in the right direction. Instead, all of their attention is on just bringing this guy down, um, which I don't think is very fruitful. And then um, with that division, um, a lot of our freedoms, I think, are getting infringed upon, such as, as we spoke about in our last episode, the infringement of our Second Amendment rights and um, the infringement on uh, religious views has been huge and, and growing greater and greater. Um, mm-hmm. And um, so, so those, those are the, the two big, big red flags that I see um, happening that um, if we don't pay attention to them now, I think that would cause the, a, a war to happen. Um, if people just start waking up to these things, I think we could avert an uh, impending war, but until they, it, until they do or if they don't, a war is going to happen. Okay, and I would I would want to add before we keep going is that that infringement on Second Amendment rights to me is way larger than just like oh they're taking our guns like it's not about that because freedom of speech and freedom to bear arms and freedom of religion and stuff like that are very very important to keep the check and balance between the state and the autonomy of the people balanced right. and so once you start to remove those checks and balances it's going to get yeah much more constricted much more quickly right. And uh, I feel like it, it is mirroring a lot of history that we have can at least identify with. So obviously we can't really identify with the collapse of Rome, um, but they were a superpower in their day and as we are a superpower right now. So just because we're a superpower doesn't mean we can't collapse. Um, but I think it, it more follows trends of um, Germany post-World War I with Adolf Hitler coming in and offering these people these great things that sound really good, but then as soon as he starts infringing on people's rights, and then he also hated a large group of people, the Jewish the Jewish folks, and he really, you know, um, didn't do good things to them. But as soon as you allow that little, that little the, the camel's head into the tent, as they say, um, the camel's going to get all the way into the, into the room. And so I think that we're on the cusp of the camel sticking its head under the tent, and we need to stop that. As a society, in the general. camel being uh, the camel repression. Being, yeah, exactly. Okay. I would think about two things. One, uh, what is there to gain in a war today? That, uh, and and how does that uh, reflect, or, or how is that similar to what there was to gain in a war back in the forties, or back in the early part of the century, or even back another time? Generally speaking, wars were fought over land and resources. Um, I know that it, there's still that kind of advantage to taking over a place. And so if the United States, for instance, did go through a period of collapse, I could see a war over who's going to fill that void or even who was going to claim those resources. But interestingly mm-hmm. enough, it wouldn't be a war with the United States. If the United States collapsed, essentially, it would be a war between the powers that wanted to take what we had. Right. Or what was left over after our collapse. Um, yeah. And that, that, and that gets extremely complex extremely quickly. Yeah, because essentially, you know, you'd, you'd have two s- super, semi-super powers in, uh, uh, in China and Russia. You would have their direct allies. I don't ever see them fighting together because... Th- there would be too much economic loss at stake to start a war just for land. Yeah. It would have to be control of resources and yeah. access. Then you have uh, the radicalized part of the Muslim state, which in one sense we're already at war with the radical part. Uh, I don't know if the Muslims would unite around that. Uh, they seem to be preoccupied with getting rid of Israel. And so... The conditions are a little different than they were. Uh, my understanding, for instance, the beginnings of World War II is we have what you mentioned about Hitler uh, and the, the Germany almost being in a desperate situation. You have the United States basically taking a position of isolationism. So I know that contributed in part to Hitler thinking that he wouldn't have to face the United States. So basically what he was doing was launching a war against France, England, and uh, their ally Canada. Um, as oversimplifies it a little bit, but 
what would the war be over if what or no what are the circumstances that would make starting a war with an uncollapsed United States, even with all our internal turmoil, profitable? What would be the goal of that war for someone like China or Russia? If it would give them influence in the, uh, the other half of the hemisphere if they did take over. Because right now they're isolated to the eastern hemisphere. In a few pockets in the South American, Central America. Right. Yeah, and there's still... There's still plenty of land to grab, but it's not over the battle lines. So, yeah, you were to mention, like, if the United States were to collapse, there's an immense amount of global markets that are empty space that anybody can fill. And that's what I mean about the post-war order is the U.S., because of the power of the U.S. currency as being historically superior in the last century and our, our infrastructure being superior historically, we got to call the shots. And so if that were to be weakened to the point where someone else can move in and call the shots, now they can leverage the same process that we did um, to be able to call the shots that, are, that have almost always been in, to the advantage of the U.S. Mm -hmm. And there are things going on like South America a little bit, but I know Africa, there's still a land grab. Like China, lots of countries, America, I'm not aware that we're among the leaders of other countries like China and so on doing massive deals and trying to install massive amounts of infrastructure and uh, industry in places like Africa that are completely untapped as economic hubs. And there's more natural resources in Africa than anywhere else. Uh, and there's a, there's an adage I heard a few years ago where like we're fighting the Taliban on one side of the mountain range in, the, in Afghanistan and, and China's just paying the Afghan, the Afghanistan government to be able to mine on the other side of that mountain range. Like they're not getting into the conflicts that we are. And we're in those conflicts for different reasons, ideologically and economically, uh, but they're taking a much different approach. And I think uh, many of the preconditions for World War One, especially, were things like you just mentioned of like, oh, things are too interconnected economically. Like actually the prosperity and the level of innovation and improvement of quality of life were booming at an unprecedented rate in human history right before World War One popped off. And the reason it seems to have popped off from what I can understand, and this is me being informed by guys like George Friedman, uh, what's that guy's name? David something Harris, David, uh, historian, I forgot his name, and Dan Carlin's podcast series on World War One and World War Two, and as he's, he's commentated on the Cold War as well. Um, so my opinions are really formed in that way, but they were really, really economically inter interconnected in ways that people are like, oh, there's no way a war would serve anyone, but that it happened. And the reason that happened was a lot of really, really rigid ideological and political structures that seem to be galvanizing themselves in a similar way now. And the checks and balances got atrophied enough where something popped off and then it cascaded. Right. And so big powers will do it, especially, for example, if the U.S. were to get into a civil war and weaken themselves to where there wouldn't be as unified a front, especially between us and our allies, which um, other nations like Russia and China could be like, oh, well, let's try a proxy war over here. For example, in uh, – forgetting the nation's name right now – a proxy war somewhere else where Ch Russia has already – overtly challenged the U.S.'s policy mm -hmm. in several different borders. And uh, we seem to be relatively soft in there. So they already know, like, oh, we, we've got some wiggle room here. We can mess around. And so similar to that, in World War II, the U.S. and Russia hated each other. But they really hated the Germans. So they fought that. But uh, as Dan Carlin talks about, he's got a podcast series, Supernova in the East, where he talks about from the time the atom bomb was dropped, how did that change politics at the time and how does, why was the Cold War the way it was? And it was for that reason and so on. So, mm -hmm. but right in the, uh, right in the wake of World War II, everyone's like, oh, Russia and the U.S. are going to fight now. So even though, for example, let's say China and Russia are like, well, we hate each other. We both want the same pie. We'll work with each other against a common enemy. And once the U.S. is knocked out or at least curtailed enough to where they're not superior anymore, now Russia and China are going to fight. And that's a historical thing with wars anyway. So, yeah, there's any number of ways it could shake up. And I don't, I'm trying not to be naive in that people think, oh, we're beyond the level of warfare from the past. 
and Dan Carlin in his series mentions it, where even Einstein was like, World War III is going to be fought with the greatest weapons of all time, but World War IV will be fought with sticks and stones. Yeah, that's so the that's, mitigating. It, it that's, could get there very quickly. It is, yeah. That's the mitigating part that, that I, I wanted to ask the question about what the, the nature of the war is going to look like. I would agree with you. I think the uh, I think there's a real possibility of there being an imminent war. But the Cold War looked like the Cold War looked because the threat of fighting with our maximum weapons after World War II, mm -hmm. because of the advent of the atomic bomb and stuff like that, mitigated the advantage yeah. of a victory. And right, like, but before 1950, that threat was utilized by the U.S. Mm -hmm. a few times successfully. Yeah, it was. And uh, so, you know, when I was growing up, the issue was uh, mutually assured destruction. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and it was uh, spoken of as a deterrent. It's sort of insane, and I think we're probably... Okay, so I don't think that uh, a fighting conflict globally utilizing nuclear weapons is going to be very likely between the super or semi-superpowers. Mm -hmm. I think a terrorist model is different, though, because if you're so small, you're going to be overrun no matter what, and you just are so filled with ideological purpose right. or hate or whatever, passion, I mean, even if we don't yeah. make it pejorative, if you got your hands on the ability to, to start something like that, um, you know, then you've got a, a good miniseries in yeah. the making. And yeah. that's why there's, the U.S. has a huge incentive to be involved in the terrorist war, but China doesn't. Mm -hmm. Right. Because they can let the U.S. clean up that trash, and then they're going to keep bolstering their economic power right. first because they have their own problems. Like I won't pretend to be educated on all those, but they're pretty yeah. big problems. But so they're not worried about our problems, yeah. but are we have an egg because we're in such a position as the policeman of the world. And there's various opinions on that, but we are, and there's some ways in which that's a very good thing. We have the obligation to address that risk. Um, and because this past century has been a century of oil, we have a huge incentive to keep our hands leveraged in the parts of the world where that makes a difference, which is right. where a lot of those conflicts are going down. And we need to keep that leverage, but the next the next century is going to be electric power and nuclear power. Yeah, and China already knows that. One uh, seemingly small, but I, I don't think it was insignificant at all, uh, illustration that I think is on the minds of world leaders that would mitigate against this. And again, I'm accepting uh, radical, ideologically driven, which like terrorist people, I'm not talking, you know, like heads of state of, of countries like Russia and China. Russia's involvement in Afghanistan uh, preceded ours and preceded the terrorist war, and it was devastating for their country mm -hmm. uh, because they just couldn't win it. No matter how much power they had, you can only apply so much power. It's like 100 guys trying to fight one guy. Only two or three guys can get in a punch at a time. Mm -hmm. And if the guy can handle those two or three, it doesn't matter whether you have a hundred or a thousand guys trying to fight him. Yeah. Just because proximity doesn't allow the contact. And and it was a proxy war in that we were funding other sides of that exactly, conflict as well. Exactly. And now they're doing it back to us in the same way. Yeah. But my point is is that uh, if they really thought that they could could win that war when they went into it, I don't know the Russian mind. But if they really thought they could win that war, it was proven that it was very, very difficult to do. And so even I'm thinking about this in, in some kind of uh, what would you call it, a post-apocalyptic United States collapse. What's the nature of a, of a collapsed U.S. going to be? Uh, is it going to be run by liberals and anti-gun people? No. Or is it going to be run by survivalists and people who refused, which caused the war in the Probably first place? Those. Yeah. And so this would be a dang difficult country yep. to come in. It's like the old movie Red Dawn or something like that. Right. Resistance would be built into our core. Well, and, it has been. And that's Second Amendment rights and so on, where our people have been given the autonomy to fortify themselves as much as they want. Mm -hmm. And when people are left to their own devices, they take fortification pretty seriously, mm -hmm. especially in the face of risk. Yeah. But right now, if our nation were to be curtailed to that point, oh, there's a civil war which is bankrupted, destroyed all the infrastructure, destroyed the cohesiveness of the people themselves, that's pretty ripe for invasion. Although you would have a gargantuan invasion effort on your hands. Not, not that I think everyone would have to do that, but you would be weakened to that point. And I think the last of the series of three things you said, that the cohesion of the people themselves, um, I think what we have is we have a big, loud, ideological voice 
from the left. And uh, a quiet behemoth on yeah, the other side. And, and, and that left truly doesn't understand what it would take to forcibly implement their ideologically. I mean, their ideas uh, uh, and ideology. I don't remember the guy that said it, but he was some liberal congressman or something that uh, was joking, I think. And uh, people responded to him about uh, the ideology he was putting out, the New Green Deal or whatever it was, that, uh, well, the other side has all the guns. And he said, but we have nukes. Now that, I was about to add, I think they're realizing very quickly how much force would be required for them to implement their ideology. Yeah, uh, so that would, that revealed that, and then, of course, he backpedaled on it really quick. But uh, to use nukes, you have to get some lieutenant that's in his late 20s to push the button with another lieutenant right. on our own people. I have a very hard time seeing that happen more than yeah. once. Well, even in a, not less patriotic, but even in a more pathological society... There's a f there's been multiple stories, and the one I know best is there was a drill that went down where the wrong the orders were then put in a format that was not a drill to a submarine in the ocean somewhere to launch a missile at the U.S. Mm -hmm. and it did get down to that dude with the button, and he said, and inside of for a few minutes inside of that submarine, the captain was losing his mind on the lieutenant whoever it was, and the lieutenant's like, I'm I'm not going to push this button. He was willing to forfeit his life to not have to do that yeah. and that's the reason a few minutes later oh sorry it was a drill mistake stand down I'm like oh shoot well we almost destroyed the world yeah so that's a very extremely romantic thing to me about the human aspect it can still remain intact and with most of the human people that i know about in our military there are some people <laughs> there's jokes that go around of like some rednecks join up to go fight the terrorists because like what other excuse do you get to have to go fire awesome guns, you know? So, like, there's part of that, but uh, generally, <clears throat> I've got a couple buddies who became officers through ROTC, but, and we went to their graduation from college, and then directly after that, there's a ceremony where they, as officers, get sworn in, and the oaths are made very specifically where those people are equipped and empowered as servicemen and as warriors, but they're also given the legal precedent and the legal ability to think autonomously. And human beings, from the type of demographics that join the forces in the greatest numbers, are the type of people who have the value systems, like you're saying, of like, I'm not going to drop a nuke on America. Even if we do have, you know, elevating levels of kind of compartmentalization and, and things are getting more and more loud and more and more contentious, in a way, I think it's going to, I personally think it'll correct within the next decade in an interesting way that we don't know how to work out. But even if that's the case, I think our country should be roughly three or four different countries by how the people tend to be culturally um, dispersed. Mm -hmm. So in the event of a civil war, maybe you would get new borders. But even if that happens, you have to be so economically cohesive that it might just, it might just be a matter of ceremony. I don't think it would fundamentally change the fact that as one landmass, the U.S. would have to stay intact. Because now you would disperse all of that military strength on itself. Now you have to have, you know, millions of miles of border instead of just a few thousand, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm envisioning the map with a bunch of uh, small things other than the U.S., you know? Right. Like Texarkana or something like that. Yeah, one, think about that. Because Texas state. would be the first to do it. Like, all right, we've got enough land. We'll, we'll make tanks. Uh, then think of the easy pickings in California, Oregon, and Washington. Right. Yeah. What? If, yeah. And so now, what if? And Can they you see would Hollywood recognize... defending its own yeah. territorial status? I yeah. don't think so. <laughs> Throw stu head. stucco scaffolding at him. Throw your car in the ocean. Block him off. You know, like <laughs> that won't happen. Yeah. And I think, let's say, Oregon, Washington, California, like, oh, we're going to be our own country now. We've got the fifth biggest economy in the world. Whatever. Okay. Are you going to defend the coast against Russia? Mm -hmm. And. Once Russia occupies you, who are you going to call for help? There's no, ins I don't understand an incentive that would be, oh, we're going to do our own thing. And, that's and for my, the other that's side. Whole thing, I, I would absolutely agree that the conditions and the historic cycle and everything points to it. But it seems to me that uh, a, a cost analysis mitigates against it. Right. Okay. I, I agree that from a logical perspective yeah. of people that actually think. Okay, but you're saying because people are thinking 
illogically and irrationally. Yes. Yeah. And they always have, actually. I mean, in, that's in, why. That's yeah. why. If people always thought logically, there would be no war ever. That's yeah. a good point. Yeah, World but War One should not have happened. But that it was basically people the don't think ambition that of what Kaiser Wilhelm or whoever the leader of Germany was at that time. He just thought we could do this. He was. From my limited understanding, he was trying to set up the political game board where he could leverage something, and because the game board was set up such, no one would pop anything off. But, like, a couple things were late or not communicated well, so the wrong, it popped off. Because the, cause the, once the dominoes started, he couldn't stop them, and he was trying to get a couple things in place before that started falling. Because, see, other, other wars, like Vietnam was obviously the war when I was growing up and all that. It's easy to see how an ideological battle happens in, in one nation of a similar culture where, where people are grasping for power. Same thing with Korea before right. my time. Those things I could see happening. Could I see it happening in the United States? I could see it happening because of all these things they're trying to take away from the people. They're trying to take away our firepower. They're trying, yeah. they're trying to take away our democracy vote. The Electoral College, they're trying to get this, uh, disestablish. That's right. Which they could, and actually, that's why we should act, uh, get the, what's it called? Petition. Petition going to start, yeah. yeah, because they will abolish it. There, there are all these things moving, but we're just being naive to them. Because we're like, it's not going to happen because it's not going to happen. Well, that, that's, that's not how life works. That's fair. Just because you don't want something to happen, or just because you're naive to it, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Yeah. And I... It is troubling to me because it seems like, and this, maybe I'm announcing my political part, uh, tendency, but like it seems to me that most people who are very against Trump are so mad because he's doing all these things in a way, uh, in a very swashbuckling, reckless way. And it's, to me, it's like, yeah, we've spent 30 years bolstering the the power of the president that used to be he used to be one piece in the whole system that had way better checks and balances than they do now and they're all mad that he's this terrible person you have to impeach him it's like no you guys voted to give him these powers yeah. so if you want to do that you have to go you have to reverse the process rather than you know ramping up the process right. to remove more checks and balances it's a terrible idea and give, and, and, give and the it, power back to the people don't keep giving the power over to the government. Right. Don't ask the government to fix all your problems. That isn't what the government's for. And Well, I, I will uh, undoubtedly reveal some of my political leanings in this situation. Um, I have tendency to come and agree with you, but what really is the basis for the power that the president has? Um, I can't think of a lot of things that Donald Trump has attempted to do that don't have the backing of the majority of Americans. Yeah, the slight majority. Yeah, but the majority right. still. I, I agree, but that, that's what I'm saying. Let's let's just. But, 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 but okay. Wait, let me finish my point. My point Come is on, is that those the, the the execution of existing laws, the 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 enforcing of existing laws that are on the books and in support by the majority, even if it's a slight majority is considered radically swashbuckling. And I'm just borrowing your term. I'm not suggesting you coined it or whatever. That seems weird to me. I agree. That seems very weird to me. Uh, it would seem to me that in our country, and with our country's history, socialistic ideas that are held by, what, 10, 15% of the population, most of them in college, uh, and I could be being old and naive, you know. Yeah, but, I think it's much higher than now, but they're intellectually bankrupt, per well, my understanding. Yeah, yeah but, but what I'm saying is that, uh, for, uh, for a shift in fundamental political ideology, there's not, a, there's not anything near a majority support for that. I agree. So, Interesting. Yeah, I don't know the metrics. The argument is between socialism and continuing with capitalism, and to argue for... Continuing capitalism is considered radical. Yeah, well, let me add to that. Weird. That that debate, that argument is happening right now based on a platform, and we could I, I'll circle back to what you guys had a whole podcast on on community, and you kind of brushed over the social media aspect and how it works into what we think of community to be. But the reality is, is the reason some of those uh, by percentage low lowly held views demographically are are now front and center competing with each other 
and is being bolstered up by the infrastructure and the function of a capitalist system. And that's the it, only thing that's allowed it to be to, to right. surface on such a front of mind level. Yeah. It's not the it's not the majority of people in the United States who believe. For, and and, and I'm, yeah. this is part of our topic because what would what would trigger a war, right. an internal war? It's not the majority of people, by any stretch of the imagination, who uh, yeah. are voicing opinions that we should dump capitalism and go to socialism. Right. But it is the majority of people who are protecting the minority to talk. And the characteristic of not, you know, you guys have talked about Second Amendment rights, free speech and, and, and the suppression of speech. I don't hear any conservative people saying to uh, Alexandria, what her name, uh, uh, Casey or whatever. What's her name? AOC. Um, Let's uh, call her AOC. AOC. Let's call her AOC. Yeah. <laughs> I don't hear anybody suggesting from the conservative side of things that AOC shouldn't be able to say what she says. But I hear all yeah. kinds of people. I've heard a few people say she just says stupid stuff. Well, well no, no. But that, I'm not as well and, and, and that's, you know, our, uh, uninformed. It depends on how pejorative you want to be. Yeah. But I hear all kinds of people that would consider themselves ally of the message of AOC saying that you or I or Ben Shapiro yeah. or somebody else You can't be say mean say things anymore. You can't say it. Anyway. Yeah, we've we've evolved so far as humans. You can't say mean things, and I'm willing to be extremely vitriolic and enforce that against you that you can't right. say it like, using laws. Do you not see the using contradiction? Laws. I know, and so. so that's is that a sustainable? Okay, is that strategy from the two sides enough to cause a war? Because of the powers that be, I think so. If if it keeps getting more and more stretched, how it is, mm -hmm. there will there has to be a breaking point. Okay, but so then, who on the left is going to take up arms? I didn't say it was going to be a. a, a it's long not going to be an even war. Okay, I, I didn't say any of that. I, there just is a war coming. So and what, then, what do you do with the people that still disagree and think that socialism should be? Acceptable. Should do think that immigrants should be allowed to just come to the country willy nilly. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. What do you do with those people? Hopefully, you would continue to reinforce that they have the right to say that, right, in this country. Yeah. In other words, we're fighting you so that you have the right to say whatever stupid thing yeah. you want. Yeah. It's. I, I so wish that, we had more time to talk about. It. Go ahead. Yeah. So that that's why why I think a war is going to happen. Long war. Who knows? So what do you think it'll look like? I mean... Uh, that is so hard to know. Yeah. From historical presidents, it's either going to be a complete collapse of society, anarchy, and then we'll rebuild the government, um, which would be what, what I think is going to happen. is isn't a complete collapse, but some kind of collapse of government, and then we'll restructure it in a way that um, these majority people fighting for minorities right to be heard nonsense stops um which would probably meet be at least for some period of time um policing uh news which i think is a stupid idea but i think it will happen where um you can't just say bullshit on the news anymore um for one side or the other it has to actually just be news again mm -hmm. that that's what i mean by policing not that they're going to be, you can only say these things, but it has to be both sides of, of, it, of the agenda. Well, it's been that way, but it hasn't been over, and it hasn't been made litigious. Right. Okay, so let me um, throw some images out there. To but if to it does go into complete about. anarchy, then I think it would open up the door for these other powers to come in um, for world domination of sorts. And That I agree with, totally. And so can you repeat if, that if, sentence? If, if it gets to the point where where we break down, yeah. there will obviously be a vacuum and other people will be tempted to test it. Yeah, if, if we start having a battle line between the North and the South again, martial law will be invoked and that will be broken up quick. And I, I did want to mention, with our society today, once there becomes real bloodshed, I don't know how much, our, I don't know how much the left will have a stomach for that. Or, <laughs> That's my point. Or, oh, this gets complex because now you're talking about assessing even a part of society as a psychologically as an individual and if you were to do that there are some behaviors that have been exhibited with, which m could make you there's the argument that it's a very pathological viewpoint which means they will do nothing but escalate so if that happens it'll get very bloody very quick but i my personal 
intuition is that they would, once you're starting to see, oh, 30,000 people died today in New York when there was a battle line in, in Times Square, I don't think people really have a, really, and once you have every second person with a cell phone documenting people being cut up over a law, I like that, that'll that get really weird. Really I agree quick. with you from, again, the logical standpoint, but you would think the same thing would have happened at Auschwitz in Germany. And they, okay. Except there wasn't the technology. Right, let me jump on that. I know there that wasn't the technology to spread that around. There were a lot of people that, that believed that it wasn't happening. Right. right. And but but even with this technology, a lot of people are under the assumption that a lot of what they see is fake anyway and those kind of things. And so just because we have the technology doesn't mean that it'll be used in a fruitful way. And just because you think people don't have the stomach for it, people are morbid. By nature, it's weird, but they are. Mm. Especially when you put, especially when you are confronted in the and, environment and, with and that, you, and parts of and it if come you put, out. If you put a, a tagline on it that says something that it really isn't, such as like, "All these people were massacred for X, Y, or Z," it could either rattle people up more, mm -hmm. or it's a complete lie and they weren't massacred. Like this other event happened, but that's what the tagline you're putting on it. Yeah. So yeah, technology can can totally can totally flip and it could be a huge world right. war that yeah. just continues. So it could go either way. I'm not saying that it will yeah. become right. that. No, of course. But I'm saying saying that it won't become that is very naive. Yeah, well. I would not say that it cannot. But but I do want to add that yes, you're right. There's parts of people most people are not integrated enough to understand that they are an absolute barbarian. Yeah. And that I mean, they could be in the right situation. Look at like the shows that are trending that are the most popular, like Game right. of Thrones. It's like, right? What do you like about that? People are just getting slaughtered left People and right. People like everything. Oh, about so that. you like that? Because that's or a much all the horror movies that come out. People love that. Yeah, it's a they side of you that exists. They don't want to say it. Like they don't want to. They don't want to admit to it out loud. But yeah. you're inertly drawn to that kind of stuff, which yeah. I think is grotesque. Yeah, I personally don't watch those things for that reason. Well, right. there's a different way, though. Be there's a gray area there because avoiding it doesn't mean that you're that you're removing it or right. lessening it in yourself. It actually might mean that you're suppressing it, and that's more of a risk. Could be. And it's an adage like it: the more someone is adamant that they're a good person, is the more suspicious you should be of them. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is that institutionalized cynicism? What? No, it's just a realization. And this is me. Like I've had confrontations in my life in which in the aftermath, I was like, whoa, I escalated way. I didn't know I would have acted like that. Yeah. I know that's true. Yeah. So it's like, and the way it's been put to me, like Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson has articulated this to me, but other people have made similar things where the parts of humans that are willing to bludgeon another human to death are way older than our idea of nonviolence. Right. Like it like the the weight behind those is massive. So there has been stories like like different riots like uh, 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 Black Lives Matter running into another demonstration of people and it becomes violent. Like once you have people on a side it can get really dark really quick and that's because the systems that are at play are way bigger than us and I want to I hope this doesn't get us off track because you guys were talking about community and technology and how that's working in social media where right now I think all of us more and more and more are not only tethered to our technology, but on social media, now you've dispersed consideration of other things that you never would in your daily life. So the cognition of our society right now is global to the society itself. Even if you have pockets of very different ideologies, it's all being considered on one platform like Twitter. So yeah. when once once a massacre in New York is broadcasted across the whole thing, that really changes how the society itself will think about it because it's so much more interconnected. And there are people like Sam Harris who understand this in a way most people don't, and they're already like with people being pilloried and really really victimized for some stupid slip of the tongue something they shouldn't have said or maybe they have a bad opinion but they say it on a platform where now the whole society's like this terrible person that's really dangerous in a way where there's no recourse sam paris has said guys we we have this technology now we have this black box we need to develop a better way to talk so that there is recourse so that there is an ability to stay on the level of words and discourse before we get to that level of violence. And okay, so, so that's that, that brings you back to the, something I said earlier, and I want to clarify. Uh, so I think that the ideas that uh, AOC promotes 
are dumb. Mm -hmm. But I vigorously believe in her ability. Yeah, to do she that. should be able to announce her naivety. And I, I don't everyone. think I don't think that she's dumb for having dumb ideas because right. I, I think there's probably educational and, and societal and friends and cultural things. Yeah, but you don't get there by being dumb. No, no, you don't. And uh, I think before we have the shooting war and we all turn into the barbarians we could be, there has to be some radical degeneration that, again, because the people on the other side would fight to defend right. her right to say that and her mm -hmm. dignity to say it. Some yeah. of them, not all of them, not all. And, and I'm not uh, naive enough to believe that, that um, the left or the right are ideologically pure and and, and socially yeah, absolutely good not. in every instance. That's not the case. And, and I don't even have the ability to do that. But, you know, I think in terms of the, the breakdown that we're talking about that would require the war, uh, actually, we've almost talked about it in two ways without making a distinction, that the war would cause a breakdown and the breakdown would cause the war. So which does come first there, the chicken or the egg? Hopefully the breakdown. I think the breakdown would, ha would have to happen. I think that's what I initially I'm trying to get across is that it's a slow progressive thing that we're go going toward this this breakdown in terms of debt in terms right. of our liberties being stripped away slowly but we're like oh it's just that little thing I'll just let that slide whatever like yeah, it's not it's not a big it's not a big takeaway yeah. you know and um, what else go ahead but slowly but surely these things are getting taken away from us yeah and, and we're surrendering them. that's and, the other half yes we are we are allowing that to happen and so unless we put our foot down, so to speak, and stop that from happening as a society, that will lead to the breakdown. Yeah, well, I want to add that, yes, I think uh, I think many smart people know this, too. Things can get a lot worse before they start getting better. But to use the political side in the 2016 election as an example of now, like, oh, like Russia messed with our stuff. People are manipulating us through social media. There's huge blowback against Facebook and to a, to a smaller extent, Twitter now. Um, and especially in Washington, there's huge blowback and things like, so you could cite that as a huge breakdown and social media massage to the surface, the dark corners that we weren't watching before. But we're hate. So that was a breakdown. And we're learning to correct in a way. So although this technology has the power to careen things out of control, there are still people involved that are like, whoa, now that we know about this, we need to consider it. And I think... Meaning there's societal power. Yeah. And I think above there the, are... The, the power to corrupt the social media. Yeah, there are people who are definitely, instead of swinging so far side to side, they're starting to realize we need to swing this way yeah. so things don't keep creating out of control. And there are some people like, I know Sam Harris is doing a really good job at this and Jordan Peterson, I think is doing a good job at this and other people as well. But those people kind of are pitted against each other, those two personalities, mm -hmm. but they have had a whole series of times where they'll book out a massive auditorium and just talk where they both have very different ideas, but they're willing to be, um, they're willing to be up on the pedestal to model that kind of behavior. Right. Like, I completely disagree with you, but let's talk and see where we differ so that we can see what's going on so that we both get smarter. And so those people are somewhat coming from different sides of the spectrum. They probably wouldn't put it in those words, but let's relate it that way. Because they're, they're icons of a much larger following, so they're trying to model that on this platform. And so I, I think that's powerful. And that's an example of, oh, we have this. It can go either way. So people are learning to start to model, okay, here's how we have to use this. Yeah. Even without the congenial interaction like those two guys are demonstrating, I still think there's there's forces that mitigate. So uh, not, and I, I definitely don't want to get into this in, in force in this particular conversation, but when New York passed that law about uh, uh, you know ultimate late-term or delivery abortions, mm -hmm. and there was a big celebration about that in the news media, was uh, rightfully so, uh, showing that and so on and so forth. The reaction to that wasn't a whole bunch of people going to that celebration and trying to do it. And the reaction, unfortunately, wasn't people who advocate that inviting people who don't or who resist that into a debate. But the reaction was that a number of states have passed a thing called the heartbeat bill. And prior to the public pushing of abortion, all the way to the point where that discussion started where the guy was talking about the live baby laying on the counter and whether or not 
you know, that it was the decision between the doctor and the mother whether or not the baby was allowed the basics of life support. It, it was almost inconceivable to get a, a bill called, like the heartbeat bill. And what the heartbeat bill is about is, is that uh, abortions are legal up until the time that you can detect a heartbeat, which is way, 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 way earlier than any other abortion yep. standard. So not arguing the merit of both sides, that's not my point. My point is, is that when somebody publicly, yeah. radically celebrates something that is so important to the other part of the people that disagree, they will do stuff that wouldn't have been done. And, and so the reason I'm suggesting it, it's my understanding that Colorado, where we live, has had that uh, delivery term abortion law on the books for years, quite a few years. But it was never grandstanded. It was, yeah, never, it was never publicly yeah. done. And therefore, it didn't trigger any response out of people uh, unless they happened to know about it or were politically active. So that's one of those, those uh, mitigating things, Kevin, that I'm talking about is there's a threshold, it seems, where a person who pushes that idea, ideology so far and all of a sudden they're jumping and celebrating and doing all this kind of stuff, it triggers a response. Hope, the one I prefer it triggered was yeah. the academic sit down, let's talk about this like adults. The other one is let's politically change this climate, let's start to defund, let's do this, let's do that. Whereas decisions are made that were unthinkable even mm -hmm. a year ago, you know, yeah. as far as those states passing those bills. And then the third one, or maybe the fourth one, I don't know what the third or fourth would be, but the fourth one, the last one, would be the one taking up arms. Right. And uh, what would it take to get through those two? And, and is it possible to skip those intermediate states of conflict and get directly to a shooting war? And I don't think so. It's not apparent to me, and you would have to have a level of unification that at this time would take like a Minutemen style infrastructure that isn't even approaching. The only thing that's approaching that is like the National Guard and stuff. Yeah. And so. Yeah. And, and I think the division among the National Guard would more or less reflect the division ideologically uh, among the political arena skewed to the conservative side. Right. Because most liberal kids are not going to join the National Guard. Yeah, that's when the demographics that join those services usually have very strong and resolute values in regards to what they will or will not do. And they also have oaths that they can be sent to jail for life if they don't. So fulfill. not to trivialize it, but if it was a water balloon fight, I could see it breaking out almost any time. But if it actually was a matter of getting a, right. a set of guns and pulling the right. trigger, there's got to be something happening in between. To talk about your point about um, these people celebrating, um, the celebration can also mask all the other stuff that they passed that could also be infringing or things that we right. don't agree it's with. It's for true. It's for true. So that's the fact, strategy. The fact that we didn't even know about it in Colorado until that happened, what else do we not know is in, in, in effect already. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's also a dangerous game to play to say, once things do get like that big, then you'll get pushback, but they don't have to get that big to actually go into effect. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. And I'll, I'll piggyback on that in that, That's true. yeah, something crazy, like Trump gets elected, and now the left's like, we have to reform the Electoral College. Okay, maybe we should have Actually, done it. it's a similar reaction. It is. Yeah, like, yeah. maybe we should have done that 30 years ago. Okay, well, let's look at reforming it. But we have to keep talking so that you don't, cur you don't curtail further those same rights or the same integrity of the Constitution. Well, we have to change the Constitution. It's outdated. Like, okay, but we have to still talk because... That's the benefit of having the diversity yeah. of everyone's ideas as long as you're appealing to those more foundational values of liberty and truth and um, being cordial and harmonious as a society together, which which still, like, even though there's such a high amount of emotion, we have a relatively really, really low level of violence. And it's a great thing, and I think social media has been a resource for that. We have a, we have a relatively low level of actual violence. That's, yeah, that's what When I mean. you start calling speech violence, then you can begin to make some kind of radicalized right. argument and that then the we country's get, falling. Yeah. And then we have, get to have a conversation of like, okay, yeah. what's the definition of a word? <laughs> yeah. You know, and which how is, is my disagreement with you violence against you? Right. Right. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, you can't make the world safe. You have to fortify an individual to the world.
And if, if, if that's not your fundamental starting point for that, for fortitude, yeah, you, you will, you're going to be in an internal regress. Yeah. And we do have problems when people are allowed to make arguments that, uh, for instance, border walls are immoral, and then they're permitted to have walls around their house in San Francisco. <laughs> So there's issues that, that, that have to come up. Yeah. I guess one of the reasons that I have a little bit of hope is I think those issues inevitably will come up. Mm -hmm. I think they will. Yeah, and I think they are. I think they are because it used to be, oh, this person said in the thing this, oh, that looks good on the, in the newspaper. And then someone's like, by the way, on social media, um, did you guys know? Here's a picture of his house. So there's that. You know, like the, the, the checks and balances now are, have been completely flipped over in a way I think that's going to force people to be better about it. Last thoughts, Phil. Um, the self-examined life is not worth living. Um, to that own self, be true. And learn to talk to other people good. And don't be a dick. My last thoughts on this topic. I think it was a wonderful topic. Um, let's not be naive. Bad things can happen. Let's not be paranoid good things can happen too. Yeah. yeah. My last thoughts would be more on questions. Is, is a war coming? What are your thoughts? Let us know. If you have questions about anything we talked about, let us know. Um, I think unless there's a huge diversion, uh, diversion, divergence of how our society is currently trending, war is inevitable. But that doesn't mean that it's going to be bloody that doesn't mean that it's going to be long, but something is going to trigger. Those are my last thoughts. And this, uh, this is stuff and things. So, see you around. Yeah, record your comments. Bye bye.